Welcome everybody. This is the panel on digital well-being and my name is Michele Di Paola. I will be your host for this panel, which as you may know is part of a longer and wider process, a long-term ongoing training course called Digital Transformers. And to talk about this, I'm quickly passing the floor to Kadri Maripur from Salto PI to tell us more about the process and to introduce the whole activity today. Please, Kadri. Thank you. And hello and welcome everybody who are listening and also our panelists. Um, I am glad to welcome you on our fourth uh, session, fourth panel on the focus is on digital transformation. Altogether, we have uh, six panels on this series. And uh, you can see also the previous ones in uh, Salto P, Salto Participation Information Facebook, and Salto Inclusion and Diversity YouTube channel. This one will be focusing on digital well being as an important topic that has been probably noticed in everyone's life during the past years. Also, a few words about uh, the whole overall process that uh, Michaela mentioned. Um, digital transformation is a priority in the EU youth programs and uh, Salto B and Salto Inclusion and Diversity have been exploring it from different angles since uh, 2021. And in one point we decided to join the forces and one of the outcomes was this uh, process, uh, Digital Transformers, uh, which is partly uh, six panel sessions, is one, of the, one part of the project and the other one is a uh, training partly online, partly, partly residential, uh, for youth workers on different aspects of uh, digital uh, transformation. And uh, just uh, this week, we finished the second call for applicants. So I'm also glad to welcome 15 new uh, uh, participants on board there. Generally, to sum up, um, if you'd like to learn more about digital transformation or digital well-being, you're welcome to visit Participation Resource Pool. And uh, you can also find there the reports that were the consequence or the outcome of a one and a half years work on the topic of digital transformation and what it could mean for, for the youth field in Europe. And I would be now also glad to uh, hand over to Enrique from Salto Inclusion and Diversity. Okay. All right, uh, thank you, Kadri, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, quite excited to uh, organize this, this panel here and have this discussion about mental health. Uh, yeah, for us in Salt Inclusion Diversity, we started diving into the topic uh, yeah, with the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and we were um, coordinating a study uh, on the quality of online blended and hybrid mobility activities. So we were looking how the uh, activities were being adapt adapted to, to the COVID-19 pandemic and the issue of digital fatigue, for example, lack of motivation, interest were things that were being repeated uh, when we were approaching uh, colleagues and also youth work practitioners during our study. And we also realized that uh, because of the pandemic and the way that the activities were being adapted, many times just mimicking the traditional non-formal uh, environments, but without taking into consideration uh, the different different needs and, and different ways of uh, our needs that are need to be taken into account now when we move online. Uh, we cannot just replicate things as, as used to. Um, and we realized that th th this also caused a big impact on the young people with fewer opportunities and uh, because of these changes that not, were not always very well th uh, thought through or because basically we didn't have the experience uh, 
that also increased to uh, also led to increase the digital gap. Uh, so we were confronted with questions on how to engage young people with the opportunities online, uh, how to avoid fatigue and participants drop out because it was also uh, quite a, a constant thing that happened during these times. Um, and in general, how we can also use online tools to support mental health of uh, young people with opportunities uh, with youth workers and so on. So there are many questions that were raised during this study. Um, of course, some insights that came through, and you can also find it uh, in the digitalinclusion.saltyouth.net uh, website. This was for us also motivation to join forces with Salto participation and information and try to understand more uh, also the topic of mental health. Uh, so that's why we're also hosting this uh, webinar here and carrying on also with the online training in a few days on the topic. So really excited to learn more about it and hopefully have some answers to the questions that we've been uh, yeah, thinking about for, for quite some time. So yeah, that's it by now. Thank you very much, Enrique, and thank you, Kadri, also. So yeah, it's time to uh, kickstart our discussion about digital well-being. So we have a little presentation uh, starting from <clears throat> Simona, Simona Murschetz. Uh, she holds a Bachelor in International Relations. Uh, she's working as a freelance trainer in human right, uh, rights education and global education for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, she's the president of the Ljubljana Pride Association and manages a team of 10 staff and full-time volunteers, all coming from LGBTIQ plus community. She led uh, several large-scale projects on developing an intersectional approach to inclusive organization and co-authored and edited several educational manuals on transformation of hate speech and inclusive organization. And she bases her work on non-formal education, anti-racism, non-violent communication, restorative practice, uh, empowerment of vulnerable groups through storytelling and intersectionality. Another guest of ours today is Dragan Atanasov, acting as a secretary general of the Union for Youth Work, the National Association of Youth Workers and Youth Work Providers in North Macedonia. Uh, he's a trainer, researcher, evaluator, and author, specialized in youth work recognition, youth policy, cultural diversity, and community development, with over 10 years of experience in conducting research and assessment in the field of youth work, designing and delivering non-formal education activities, developing policy documents, and monitoring and evaluating programs. We will also have Dr. Amy Orban. Uh, she's a program leader truck scientist at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at the University of Cambridge, a college research fellow at Emmanuel College, and she leads a research group investigating the links between digital technology use, mental health, and cognition in, adol uh, in adolescence. She campaigns for the adoption of more transparent and open scientific practices, and she completed a DPhil, which is the Oxford equivalent of a PhD in experimental psychology at the University of Oxford, indeed, for which she was awarded the British Psychological Society Award for Outstanding Contribution to Doctoral Research. And we now step forward and uh, have our guests on screen to start the discussion with the first question, which uh, is the same question for the both of you. Um, so as you all understood from, from Kadri and Enrique, we are now inside a longer process, this Digital Transformers uh, training course. And in the upcoming session, which will be uh, exactly about digital well-being, preparing that, uh, that section, uh, we identified some different aspects as, let's say, kind of ingredients of uh, what we are trying to define as digital well-being. So our personal list of ingredients for this kind of recipe uh, includes uh, a healthy use uh, of devices, uh, includes uh, digital literacy to avoid you know, frustration of the users and so on, includes uh, access to proper technology to try to uh, bridge the digital divide, and of course in includes a condition of security and privacy, as well as uh, inclusive and diverse participation that was already a specific topic of um, our second panel. So we also dealt with that uh, before. So my first question to Simona and Dragan would be, 
what would be your personal recipe of digital well-being, which are your ingredients? So is this list working for you and why? Or is there any other uh, ingredient that you would uh, add to the recipe to better define and better shape uh, what is digital be uh, well-being in your opinion? And of course, again, why? Thanks, Michael, and actually thanks for sending uh, also beforehand so we could uh, reflect about them because it's not an easy question, actually, if you think about uh, I think essentially this list is uh, is good, it's quite extensive. What, what I like, um, and that's the first thing I would like to say, is that it's taking a rights-based approach, um, which is not something that we often do, I think, with uh, speaking of technology and internet. We kind of assume that everyone has the equal access to to the digital world and to, to technology that they need. And we tend to forget that uh, internet and, and technology, they are not per se inclusive, that sometimes uh, there need to be adaptations uh, to the different needs of, of different people. And this is something that we also need to keep in mind in, in network. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. Secondly, I think, um, what is important is for all of us to reflect what do actually all these terms, um, this, what do they mean? So for example, digital literacy, I think it's a very important one. Uh, but when we think about it, we should go beyond um, thinking of how, how, for example, to use a phone or how to use a certain digital learning platform, for example. Because um, being in the digital world and um, interacting with people in um, online via different social media and different platforms, etc. It's a completely different thing from, from being in the real world. I think um, we need to start, uh, we need to stop thinking that everything we are doing in the, in the real life, we are just doing it um, online and it all remains the same. I think essentially what we need to learn how to do is how to behave in a healthy way in the digital world using technology um, and how to really take care of our needs and what is happening to us and what we want to, to achieve and what we want to do with others um, when we are online. And I think to many of us who are a bit older, who didn't grow up with the internet, um, this is not a thing that comes naturally. It's not uh, something that we have always known how to do. Um, so my own recipe on um, on digital well-being might not be actually very relevant to, to young people nowadays because they've uh, grown up in a different way. We, I think we have to get used to the fact that uh, in working with young people, we are now dealing with uh, digital natives. So young people who grew up from, from uh, the very old, very young age with the phones in their hands and uh, with um, games and different applications that they used on their iPads. Uh, and they learned already in school how to interact uh, online using different uh, online platforms, even before we started uh, introducing more um, in network. So if I say that, for example, I'm trying to balance uh, between the time that is spent online and time that is spent uh, offline, or that I'm uh, switching off my notifications, or that I'm trying uh, not to get uh, hooked and addicted to news feeds on social media, for example, I don't know if that's very relevant, um, because we do see that young people spend most of the time online. So I don't know um, if it makes much sense to really try to drag them out from there and bring them back in, in real life and to, to force this kind of like balanced approach. And I think it, it is important. I think all of us need to spend time outdoors and time communicating with uh, people in, um, in the physical world and doing things uh, in a different way without using the phones and technology and the, the digital environment. Uh, so I still think that all that matters. And I think that's important part of the recipe on how to keep uh, digital well-being. However, I don't know how realistic that is with generations of young people who uh, are very often more comfortable um, spending time online and communicating with their peers uh, via different uh, communication platforms like Discord, for example, uh, than in real life. And um, I, think, I think it comes naturally that um, 
to them that a lot of what they do is now in a different uh, setting. And that's why it's even more, I think, important uh, to have this kind of list of um, our, our recipe of how to achieve um, digital well-being, uh, but then also to think how what it really actually will mean from the perspective of the young person. Because as I said, it's the digital world. I don't think it's really uh, a simple replacement of, uh, of the things that we are doing in a certain way. It's an interaction in a completely different way. It's activism in a completely different way. So for example, if you think about the um, uh, aspect of inclusive and diverse participation in the, uh, in, as part of the recipe, I would here also talk about activism. I think uh, we, in the, in the recent years, there has been a lot of criticism about clicktivism, for example, or um, putting things online and being part of an online campaign as a replacement to what is happening uh, in real life when you go out for protests. But I think we should be criticizing less and actually uh, thinking more about what the future of activism will be in the digital uh, life and what the future of communication and relationship building and, and trust building will be online. Uh, so I think the more we actually uh, embrace technology and the virtual environment as part of us, the more um, this kind of recipe would make sense. So just, uh, just a brief intro and then we can talk more. Thank you very much, Dragan, for all you said. Also for bringing up already this element of uh, real life and uh, digital life uh, as, as if they were two different uh, planets or two different elements, which is something which is being discussed a lot. And also this idea that uh, so-called digital natives may have a different experience and a different background from one side, but from the other side, I guess that uh, the recipe that you are drafting and we are drafting might also work uh, for them as well. I'm also now curious to hear from Simona. I can definitely agree to where Dragan left off, which is, um, you know, the digital um, world it's is the reality of young people i mean there is no and also the last years with how we started to change our ways of working across society uh and going so much online i think this a lot of that will stay so it's not reversible anymore i don't i don't feel that we will ever you know like not have such a strong uh, digital uh, life as you know it's just going to be stronger so i think that is that is part of the reality um, but uh, for me, when I think about the digi digital well-being, um, I have a very particular perspective on it because um, I myself am part of, you know, a mar marginalized uh, group or, you know, experience that in my life. But most importantly, I work daily with young people and with people who experience marginalization. And um, I think that when we talk about well-being in general, but also in particular digital well-being, the experiences online are different for um, young people who in their lives daily are faced with, you know, uh, being racialized, you know, experiencing transphobia, you know, other forms of discrimination, shaming, a lot of hate. And we, we know, I mean, it's not a secret, we know that the internet and generally digital spaces have opened a lot of Pandora's boxes in that regard also. So I think for me, when I look at the list of these five areas, you know, like for digital well-being that you have mapped, like healthy use of devices, digital literacy, access to more technology, yes, all of that very, very nice and fine. But then we get to the last two ones, conditions of security and privacy. So what does security mean in this regard? You know, when you are uh, exposed to being a target because of your identity or because in this case, like what even Dragan was referring to, like if you expose yourself and become like an activist 
in the digital world. You know, a young person, you can try to be everything from an influencer to uh, just an active person on TikTok. And then there is going to be a lot of backlash if you are someone who is um, belonging to any kind of marginalized group or even especially if you're speaking out, up for a certain rights uh, or certain so social changes. So I think this is this becomes a uh, very, very important issue. And then it's also connected to, you know, the inclusive and diverse participation, because uh, not all young people have uh, um, equal capacity or ability to uh, be included in society, including the digital world. And, you know, and we... Um, also need different support in order to be able to participate fully. I think these are not concepts that would be new. I think all of these concepts in youth work uh, have been there for years. It's just that now they also get this element of how do we deal with them in the digital world. So, um, for example, for me, one point that I would add there is um, that, you know, we I would I would add something there that that would say building resilience and support. You know, and what I mean by that is that when you are a young person coming from, you know, experiencing marginalization, discrimination and hate, um, violence basically online quite a lot. Um, the first thing that I think is super important is for other people who don't necessarily experience the same way, this phenomena, that they give you recognition for it. So, um, so basically, um, you know, just to, to, to be recognized in your experience, that it is different, that it is more difficult, that it takes a toll on you, you know, when you are, uh, you are, um, um, you know, you, you, you need different type of understanding and support to be able then to participate, I think, in, in, in the digital environment. And, um, oh, of course, I would say also it's not only recognition, it's also then measures need to be established. And this is something we are very good in the youth field. I think we are very good at creating spaces where we try to, you know, um, challenge ourselves. What does it mean an inclusive digital space for learning? What does it mean, um, you know, spaces that are, you know, safer for people who who get targeted otherwise and so on. And I think there's a lot of measures also how to do that with, in, in digital spaces. So I would say the, rec the recognition, um, the measures to support, and then within that to build actually also, you know, young persons um, resilience to withstand because this is part of the reality. It's not going away. Uh, we don't have a magic stick to uh, tell all the uh, bullies and all the shamers and all of that uh, magically now you are doing a bad thing. I'm going to make you disappear now. That, that's not how it works. So we need to find ways how to, um, how to build this resilience together with, with the young people who experience it. And, uh, and it's not possible. I think the biggest realization is that this is our common responsibility. This is not a responsibility of the communities or organizations or, or young people who are targeted, but it is our common responsibility to find, find ways to support and to take on part of the load, you know, like to take on part of the fight to make the, the digital experience safer, to make it more inclusive, to make it more participatory. Everyone needs to contribute to that. And I think this is for me the, the core of the well-being, you know. For me, it's not necessarily talking about the individual single actions. They are very important because they showcase our willingness and awareness. But oh, this, this general attitude and recognition. So I think this is something I would add there as a reflection point. Thank you very much, Simona. But still, uh, I want also to underline from your, from what you said, yeah, this one more ingredient. Uh, so building resilience and give recognition that's uh, noted down and will be also taken into account uh, in, in our training course. But it's also interesting to uh, note down and take it to, into account in our discussion here. It's one question directly from uh, for Dragon. Uh, how can communities and organizations work together to create a safer and more responsible online environment for young people? That's yeah, the huge one million dollar question, I guess. But maybe uh, you can uh, you can maybe share your insight, and then also there is another one which is, I guess, partially also 
connected to this topic. Uh, it's more a comment uh, by Alessandra saying that's why we should work in a parallel on human rights education applied to human rights online and to internet governance and to digital youth work uh, when working with youth. I mean, youth as, uh, as such is one entity and so we should always keep this holistic approach, let's say, also connected uh, to the digital environment. But if you want to uh, also, also it's, the invitation is open to Simona, briefly uh, give some insight uh, to the question of, of George regarding a possible way of communities and organi organization to work together to ensure a safer and more responsible online environment. Yes, sure. I mean, I can say those very plastic, very obvious ones, right? So whenever uh, anyone is organizing uh, digital events, uh, use small kind of like also tokens for visibility that you are you are thinking of the different communities. So for the LGBTIQ plus people, if you, they see that you are using pronouns, so when you put, uh, you know, your your name there uh, for Zoom call or a call like we're having right now, and you put in brackets your pronouns, this is a very clear indication that you are willing to, to um, kind of like... Um, include uh, the the LGBTQ plus uh, young people with with this kind of measures, and I can, this is just one very very obvious one when it when it comes to I can say personal um, um, learning points for me in this process I have learned so much from the anti racist movement from the organizations who work in that framework, and for example in the some of the digital meetings you know like more political meetings more meetings where you needed to discuss some hot topics and so on they included some very interesting measures for example how to how to create within the digital space like that a safe person to which you know if somebody was triggered by a conversation you could go to you know things like this there are these things that we know how to use in a physical space and then uh, to create some support mechanism and then basically you transform them and make them applicable um with different methods maybe but with the same concept in the in the digital world to give this signal out to people coming from marginalized communities and i think what what is for us um important is that um you know i come from a framework where we work a lot uh, with lgbtiq plus youth right so of course we are more skilled how to um, create more safer spaces for lgbtiq plus youth sure because this is our, our you know our main work however uh if uh, you know i always have to be challenging myself also what about all the young people who live in the intersection with other marginalization you know how can i uh, uphold the same type of standards and reflection uh, for wider uh, experiences of marginalization. And I think for me, this is the core point. If everyone, uh, be it you are someone working with young people with marginalized backgrounds that you know of, or that this is your primary uh, dedication or not, that you have that reflection with your team in within your organization and that you are able to identify what are the things uh, that you can offer for wider inclusion, for showing this support. Because we know in practice that we can't create a perfect uh, um, experience, meaning that there cannot be this one Zoom 90 minute model session that is going to be perfectly inclusive and participatory for everyone. That, that's not what the expectation is, but the expectation of somebody thinks about it. Somebody thinks about what could we do better. And when, when young people also come with feedback to you that you are there to listen to what they could use and need. And I think without the res um, resistance, you know, without diminishing that uh, need, I think this is something that can, can make a lot of difference. Um, not yeah just not to repeat the societal stereotypes of like you know that we there's because there's a lot of barriers in society already or a lot of stereotypes toward marginalized communities then just not to repeat the, those in our processes of planning educational activities and processes thank you simona meanwhile amy amy orban joined us as announced so welcome amy and we will soon pass the floor to you as well. We are now answering um, a previous question from the audience. So I don't know if Dragan wants to add something on this perspective. 
or not? Yeah, I would, I would say um, it's, it's important not to think that we know it all. Huh? Um, not to think that we know uh, the needs by default of, of young people in the online environment or the challenges or the threats, because they're just places where young people are and youth workers are not. And there will be always, or not, not even only youth workers, but adults um, are not present. And there are places where that will always be the, the case. So um, for me, it's about dialogue and it's about open communication to see what young people really need from us, from the rest of the society, basically from, as you were saying, George, from communities and from organizations, and I would say from youth workers, to be in a safe and healthy environment online and what it actually means for them and what we can do without also interfering in their own uh, space. Because um, I don't think that youth workers should just invade the, the online environment of young people without being even invited there. Like, you, you know, there, for example, very good examples of using, let's say, Discord in youth exchanges or communicating with young people in this course. So for me, I think on the one hand, I think this is a good example. It's about going where young people are and meeting them there and providing the support um, in a way that seems to work for them. But on the other hand, for me, it's always a question, do young people want us there? Should we be there? Like, or are we inviting uh, a space? So if young people want to be in Discord and talk about games and play games and talk to their peers, it doesn't mean they want to talk to youth workers uh, in Discord. So, so for me, a little bit this, I know it might be now a provocation because we are usually talking about using Discord and other uh, digital tools where young people are in youth work as good positive examples. However, I would also like to open the discussion, how do we know? Huh? Have we actually asked young people, if, are we invited there? So maybe instead of that, we, we need to also talk to them and to see uh, where they are and what they need from us. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to ask the same question that I asked to you already, also to Wami. Ami Orban, which just uh, joined us. We were discussing about a possible uh, recipe or anyway ingredients to define uh, what is digital well-being. Uh, as I said, we identified a few of them in our digital transformers training course: healthy use of devices, digital literacy, access to technology, conditions of security and privacy inclusive and diverse participation. So we were seeing with our other guests if the list is complete or there's something to add. Simona proposed to add at least one other ingredient to the recipe, which is building resilience and giving recognition to the people uh, included in online activities. And now we are curious also to hear from you, Emmy, if the list works for you as well, or if you have, add, uh, if you have other ingredients to add or maybe some other to, to take out of the list or? Well, it's been really inspiring to hear the the other answers. And I think the there was a mention about how different young people react differently to different types of content or um, that digital well-being is not the same for everyone. And I think I'd just like to echo that. So it's not a one size fits all solution um, or thing. And I think it's a lot, in a way it's very different too. So I work a lot with policymakers who come from the health area. And so they want things like those response relationships, kind of how much will content X impact mental health or outcomes, educational outcomes. And I think for the digital, we don't have that. It will be heavily individual. Um, and so I think that's, I, I think it was great to hear that already in the answers there. And I think also that these, the concept of, all these different concepts you you mentioned will change over time. Um, we have different technologies emerging on a you know, monthly basis. And also the world is changing so quick. So something that might have been really helpful in connecting young people might feel stifling in times of conflict when you're seeing all these videos on TikTok about um, young, maybe people like you, but in Ukraine or... Um, so I think we need to just understand that the links are really diverse and they will probably, what digital well-being is for one person will change over time and it will be different between people as well. So just keeping that flexibility in mind is really crucial in my opinion. Thank you, thank you very much. 
so now we are ready to go to the second uh, round of questions. And this time uh, I wanted to ask a specific question to each of you, according also to your different backgrounds and, uh, and experiences. So Amy, I would start from you, if you don't mind. Uh, we read your profile. We know that you have a academic background and work with university and so on. So uh, my question would be if in your research, uh, well, in your research, you did investigate the connection between mental health, technology, cognition. So uh, if you could uh, summarize for us the main key findings uh, connected to digital well-being in your research. So yeah, for so I lead a a research group um, at the University of Cambridge, funded directly by government through the Medical Research Council. So we are really focused on mental health and understanding how the digital environment might impact it. And the background there is that we've seen a, a decrease in mental health in many countries across the EU, in America, as well as in the UK over the last few years, 10 years or so for most of them. And we've also seen an uptick in digitalization at the same time. And we still don't know how much these two trends are linked and, and what's driving that link specifically. So our kind of mission is to do work in that space to understand those links to both inform interventions. Main, we work mainly with clinicians, so in mental health clinics, but also to inform policy, and things like recommendations and regulations around screen time and digital technology use in kids. And I think the, if I could, would need to summarize it in two words, it's that it's complicated, <laughs> um, but I, I have a bit more time so I can um, elaborate a bit. So I, I think the, it's normal that we are, get concerned about new technologies. And I think I sent around a link that, that will be shared with you later um, that about a longer talk that I gave around um, kind of societal concerns about new technologies emerging again and again, whether that's the radio in the 1940s or the television or video games and now phones and the digital and the internet. Um, there we go, <laughs> like magic. Um, and I think the real question is what makes now different? Should we be more concerned now with social media, with something that's so interactive where likes, quantify feedback, and that might really impact young people at a really vulnerable stage in their development where they really care about what others think about them, for example. And so I think what we found is that it depends on both the type of use and the type of user. So we cannot just say, how does the digital impact mental health? Because that's way too broad. That's a question we can never answer. I think even the question about how does social media impact mental health is very broad because every young person uses social media differently. Every platform is slightly different and the same platform can be very different for different young people as well. So the algorithmic driving of content makes it very difficult to know how a specific person in front of you is actually using and being impacted by technology. So the type of technology use is really important to, to know. And we've been doing a lot of methodological innovation about how can we measure that? Because we can't measure it in time spent online. 20 minutes chatting to a, you know, a distant friend will have a very different impact than 20 minutes looking at self-harm content, for example, if I'm being very extreme. So the focus of society and politicians on time as our main currency of impact is, is misguided. And then the other thing is that it depends on the type of user as well. And again, so my work looks at broad population averages. So we take thousands, often 15, 17,000 data points from young people and we mush them all together, we average them. So we don't, there is a lot of variation between young people, but we, we really just look at the averages. And there we do see that, for example, there are more negative bi-directional links between social media use and life satisfaction in, in girls rather than boys at specific ages, for example. But also that throughout adolescence, this link between social media use and well-being and mental health seems to vary. And so I'm really interested in how adolescent development, these processes we go through, go, both socially, biologically, cognitively, 
impact um, how social media impacts us. Um, so I, I think there are there's another link that gives a bit of an overview of my initial work as well um, that I've put in there, where I think the my core um, core message would be that technology is really complicated and there the impact depends on how it's used and who uses it. And the way I often explain it to journalists is that you wouldn't trust me if I said I'd know exactly how a young person across from me will react to eating a chocolate bar if I've never met that person before. Because I, I wouldn't know, are they a diabetic? Then that chocolate bar might be really harmful. Or have they just come off the football pitch after a massive match? Have they had 50 chocolate bars beforehand? <laughs> or you know, have they had none? Or are, do they eat the chocolate bar because they're sad? or because they're hungry. All of these questions are really important. And we know that when we talk about things like diet, and we need that same amount of nuance when we talk about technology. Who, you know, who's that young person in front of us? How are they using it? What are their motivations? How does it fit into their lives? And I think we need to get, for me, the kind of politicians and policymakers there to that understanding of that complexity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And uh, yeah, it's complicated. It's a very nice title. I, I remember it was used already by, <laughs> by someone to write a book about social media years ago. So here we go again. And uh, also thanks for, for, for the elements you shared about your research, which is very interesting and impressive also for the number of data points you mentioned. Um, but yes, I guess uh, this idea of... Uh, trying to stay away from the measure of time as the only indicator of a healthy relationship with uh, technology and devices could be a very important remark to keep in mind uh, or not. Meanwhile, I'm uh, asking a question to Simona. Um, well, we, we got to know each other during the third European Youth Work Convention in pandemic time. And everything there was entirely online for the COVID restriction. So a very huge event moved uh, completely uh, inside digital spaces, uh, very intense workflow. And you know more than everybody <laughs> what this intense word means. Uh, you also work in an organization which has a wide team working meeting uh, almost entirely online or maybe entirely online. I'm not sure of that, that you will let us know more. So my question is, uh, what this experience uh, uh, teach you about uh, the practic uh, practical idea of digital well-being and insight that you could share with us uh, from these experiences, also how to shape things uh, in a way that uh, even with all this diversity and complication that Amy helped us to put on, under the lens, uh, uh, the experience overall uh, is an experience of uh, well-being as much as possible. Mm. Simona, I leave the floor to you. I am professionally involved and work for a digital um, online campaigning organization. So I'm actually working for one of those organizations who can sometimes be blamed for the clicktivisms because part of what my organization does is to organize mass petitions and we target EU institutions to, to affect policy change. Um, but in, in practice, it means that since 2014, 2015, I've been working in a distributed team online. So by the time uh, the rest of the world started to switch to Zoom meetings and online uh, working from home processes in 2020, I was like, oh, now finally everyone will understand what my past six years have been like uh, because I, I, I already you know, started working in, the, in that kind of environment a bit earlier. Um, so what I can say, so like, like talking from a perspective of a person who works in that environment and, um, uh, what, what we've uh, learned in, in our organization, we are at this moment, uh, plus minus 30 staff members across nine, uh, different countries. And, uh, we work fully, fully digitalized. And what we have learned is that, um, online communication uh, coupled with intercultural differences, it's really hard. It's really, really very difficult uh, to create 
a certain level of, you know, things that you have when you are working in the f- same physical space. So the kind of team connectedness, the kind of situation when you're when you are discussing some issues, and then when you have a person in front of you in the room, you can read their face, you can feel a bit their reaction to what is happening. You can see if they go out after the meeting and they're not feeling so well, or you know, you can see them uh, how uh, life is developing for them in that work environment but when you work only online a uh, majority of that is not present you can't read the same way what is happening for the for the people on the other side especially when you have a wider team you know and you don't necessarily get to spend one on one in in this digital environment but rather you need to have like group team meet- meetings and and group processes to organize work day to day so uh, this has been one very important struggle we've been having in the organization and um, in that regard for a team that works together over a longer period of time for an organization to build the modus operandi around it for us uh, it is crucial to be able to periodically meet offline. The offline interaction when once a year maybe the whole team gets together and uh, we also have mechanisms of sub-team meetings in in person, that's the part where we build the interaction, the connection, the relationship much more. And we have then quite good and well-established processes how to organize the work, the workflows, sometimes maybe for many people even more efficient than if we were all sitting in the same office. I think that the digital space and organizing your work around it can offer a lot of possibilities for people who are more introverted, for people who need more time to think before acting, reacting, speaking, and so on. So it brings a lot of benefits. But in our experience, that just to get over like this kind of cultural differences, uh, communicational um, gaps, uh, and the relationship building, we still need the offline uh, being together. Uh, So I think, um, yeah, I think this this has been one of the bigger uh, lessons for me throughout the the past years that... um, and I and and I really feel the same thing with my youth work um, because parallel to this, I'm I'm involved with as a trainer, but also as a manager of a youth organization, and um, for our at least for the, for the young people we work with primarily, uh, it is also very very important to be able to offer spaces where people can physically meet. Doesn't fit for everyone. Some people can get in touch with us better online. And then, of course, we we uh, support that. But for a lot of people, the physical interaction, being together in one space, the intimacy, the relationship that is built through that, it's still um, it cannot be substituted at this point. At least, I don't I don't think so. Okay, thank you very much, Simona, for sharing. Uh, thank you for sharing the experience and the learning that you got. Out of there. Uh, now I want also to ask a specific question to Dragan. I know you have a project in which you researched uh, a holistic approach to well being for young people. So uh, I would like to ask you if you can share the result of this research and the insight of uh, about what supports well being of young people in your. Um, you know, in uh, in your experience. Uh, so I know that also this involved uh, uh, creating an app or some digital tools. So we're going back to what Amy was mentioning in the beginning, that uh, using uh, time, using uh, devices or anyway online uh, elements uh, could also be a time for uh, fostering well-being and not <laughs> necessarily a time for harming or anyway uh, disrupting well-being. So, Dragan, uh, I'm curious, tell us more about this project, please. Yeah, so this is the second project in a row on uh, positive mental health, and in this one we decided to focus on developing a digital app um, uh, which can be used by youth workers um, to support young people in their positive mental health and well-being online. And the app is uh, imagined to be used um, standalone by young people, but also in addition to to other uh, approaches uh, of of youth workers. So it will be available soon online. But what is interesting, I think, is when we we, uh, did focus groups with young people on what they would like to see uh, in this app or how this app that supports their digital well-being uh, would work, 
uh, the greatest demand that came from them was about communication and interaction with other users. And for me, this was a big surprise. Like what they wanted from an app that they install on the app on their phone and that offers features like, for example, um, mood tracking, um, emergency help, uh, or um, different, for example, breathing exercises, calming down, dealing with different emotions, etc. The first top need was that they wanted to interact with, with others, which brings me back to, um, to the first project that we did, uh, which precedes the project for developing the, the app. Th this project was actually about creating a theoretical framework and an approach for supporting positive mental health through youth work. And there we, we uh, explored different domains. And of course, uh, there were multiple factors that uh, we found support the state of well-being in young people. And this included emotional support, the physical dimension, environment or the nature, spiritual, social, intellectual, and the digital world was, was part of it. But in one of the articles that uh, one of my colleagues prepared, he spoke about, and that was about really using digital, um, digital tools and versus being outside and with, with other people. He spoke about, he, or actually he cited, um, a study um, by Dr. Nicholas Cardegas, who spoke of three basic human drives um, in human needs. And they were the need to belong and feel connected with others and relate to them. So that's the first one. Then the need to discover new things. And the third one uh, is the need to challenge oneself and reach goals. So three uh, basic drivers that could provide, um, that, that could enable or that would enable young person to um, or, or any individual to be uh, healthy um, mentally. And if you think about these basic needs, it's not that the digital world does not meet them. So the, the need to belong and to, to feel connected to others or the need to discover new things, all of this is available also online, maybe even much more than uh, than if you are not connected to the to the internet, like what we are seeing, for example, in the moment by many young people, is that how strongly attached they feel to imaginary communities outside of their own place of living. So they feel much closer to somebody who lives on the other side of the world because they can connect um, online uh, and they can find somebody who is similar to them in many other ways compared to, for example, their neighbors. So. We, we see young people associating themselves with this kind of online groups more than with their uh, town or their school or their um, even, even nation. Like I see in my country that young people follow and care more of what is happening uh, with uh, Greta's protests or uh, in the US with different movements than what is happening in their own town on the square because uh, this is how they, they connect and interact. So my point was, um, and it goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning, it's not that when we talk about being in the digital world, it's not the same things just done virtually. It's a different way of interacting and it's a different way of connecting with others. And then when you talk about the basic human needs and drives, it's about meeting those drives and needs differently. So I think it is essential for us to understand that um, to, and to learn how to approach this in a healthy way, how to take care of ourselves when, for example, we are overloaded with communication online. Like I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an anthropologist, but, uh, you know, it doesn't take much thinking to really consider that uh, maybe like two year, or 200 or 100 years ago, people lived in a village and they were surrounded by, let's say, 200, 300 individuals. Uh, majority of the of the world's population. Uh, nowadays, we interact with thousands of people online. So, how to help? How to manage those expectations and interactions, communications, and relationships, and the adventure and uh, the safety, um, the safety aspect in an environment which is much wider and much more chaotic than than what we see in, in real life. So. Uh, going back to, to your question, Michele, the project maybe, or the project, the two projects opened more questions than, um, than uh, that they provided answers. 
what we are working on now is really to develop this app that will provide uh, a tool, a digital tool for the youth worker to be able to use uh, in addition to the methodology that they are using. Um, uh, otherwise, because I do not believe that youth work and youth workers should suddenly fully move um, online and abandon what we used to do and how, how we, we do things with young people. However, we need to find tools that work and uh, that can help and enrich um, our way and our abilities to basically um, interact and support young people online. Thank you very much, Dragan. So I'm wondering now if there's something that you uh, would like to pick it up and comment from what you heard from some of the other guests. Well, I, I thought Dragan's points were really insightful that the way we interact online is very different. You know, the underlying needs of what we that drive our behavior might be quite similar, but they, the way that then that plays out can be quite different. In parts, it's very similar as well, but things like um, that communications can really spread very quickly, that we get quantified feedback. I'm really interested in the kind of that many young people have real expectations, how many likes they will get, and then they might get more or less. And that's a really quantified version of being accepted or not. Um, so my, my team is doing some work on that. But also things like things are permanent. They can be screenshotted. They, um, and so they can be shared more, more openly. And also that there are delays between communication. So young people that might ruminate more <laughs> or kind of rethink what's happening socially in their mind a lot might find it more stressful that, you know, you don't know if that person's seen your message or not. You know, you don't know if your friend just didn't see your post come up due to the algorithm of Instagram or that they decided not to like it. And so the sort of social currency of things become a lot more unclear. I think there's a lot more kind of thinking low that young people need to do to understand where they sit in their social network and their hierarchies. So I thought that was a really insightful comment to make. Thank you very much, Amy. So, because I, I, I would just like to connect uh, specifically to um, what Dr. Amy Urban said, um, because I, you know, like everything that, that you research, the general trends and all this, um, what both you and Dragan have um, um, kind of expressed about how um, on one hand side difficult it is to really understand the impact uh, on the young people now with the digital world and this kind of like the mass of interaction that is there. So what I try to always bring to the light is that all of that complexity is much more complex uh, for vulnerable groups. And uh, it becomes much more impactful very often in a negative way to those who are experiencing marginalization because they're easier targets. And then the, the hate and the targeting is multiplied in the same way as we could, you know, see with everything else. So, um, for example, for me, what is very relevant is that when we are as youth workers or trainers or, you know, like just people involved in supporting young people, when we are uh, creating um, spaces to, to support them to become more active in society, to become activists, to become engaged citizens, to become, you know, a lot of those things that we want everyone to be and have access to, that we also consider on the toll. What are we really asking of people when they come from marginalized backgrounds? How much more exposed they are going to be, how much more targeted they're going to be, how much more vulnerable they are, and how much bigger of an armor they need to uh, to kind of like be able to be in that position. So there is a difference if you are, uh, you know, like, um, you know, for example, a person of, of color in a predominantly white society like my own country, Slovenia, and then you would try to go and do social activism for, you know, it doesn't matter even environmental rights, right? But the point is that you are entering a hostile environment because activists and, and you know, and doing activism per se is not something that is positively uh, 
uh, accepted and you will face backlash from opponents of, of that politically. But then because of your identity, you will be exposed to masses and masses of hate. And be it, you know, fat phobia, be it based on racism, be it based on homophobia, transphobia, and so on and so forth. And I think this is part of the reality as well. Um, so for me, uh, this is something I would just like to put out there to work with more awareness around it. And that the way we build uh, up uh, uh, young people and the way we create spaces for young people to get empowered, that we also consider this, that we don't um, amplify the precarity in which they are already finding themselves. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think it's really complicated because that precarity and vulnerability can be very different. So for different people. So there was, I found there was some research done in the U S recently showing that for transgender youth in the U S for transgender youth in the U S <laughs> um, the access to social media might also be a really important way for them to develop their self identity to explore beyond their physical communities, but they're also incredibly vulnerable in certain ways as well. And so you're having to weigh up different risks. And I think that's why, even though I really just work with the data and the numbers, where I think it's really become comes down to the certain individual who's in front of you and, and the person, you know, the naturally youth workers or clinicians or parents need to be able to be educated to make those judgments as well as empowering young people to think about that as well. So I think vulnerability and the kind of amplification of vulnerability is, is a really crucial point that I, I really, yeah, I appreciate you raised. Thank you very much, Amy, and also Simona for, for pointing this out. No, I just uh, was reminded by Amy and Simona um, of another study that we did, and that was about how uh, users learn online. And what turned out to be is that for, for most young people, the biggest challenge to online and blended learning was that they didn't know how to organize their time when learning online, and they didn't plan uh, the tasks and uh, the online learning responsibilities uh, adequately so they couldn't finish what they started. I do think that we take it for granted that we know how to manage in the online world, be it learning online, be it um, the, uh, now not to waste time, but the other um, aspects that Amy and Simona spoke about, and we do need education about it. So I fully agree with what uh, Alessandra and the others are also stating that we do need to get educated uh, on how to manage online. And I don't think that we need that we provide at the moment enough education and support to young people uh, in school or out of school also in, in network. Yeah, thank you. And I would ask one last question to you all. And it's indeed already a bit in this direction. So uh, we would uh, need to have some uh, uh, concrete tips and indications from your side. And I'm asking to the three of you, maybe starting from you, Dragon, this time, uh, exactly about uh, how we can support digital well-being uh, in online spaces and environment, especially for the ones, uh, of course, uh, which have uh, longer time to spend uh, in, in those uh, spaces and environments, not depending on only on their will, for instance, schools or other kind of activities or jobs. But in general, uh, we would like to kind of build up a little list of practical tips of how to uh, ensure the most possible well-being conditions in uh, activities that are held online. So we have a framework. We heard some uh, very interesting point uh, about how to shape things in this framework. And now maybe we can end trying to be as much practical and concrete as we can to share like yeah tips and tricks for everybody listening to us on how to try to ensure the well-being in the in the digital domain dragon i would start from you please very often and i'm sure many of you have seen this when somebody facilitates an activity online uh, when when we start we usually say make sure you have your water or tea or another liquid next to you and make sure that you sit in a comfortable position. And then uh, once in a while, like after one hour, you can uh, you can ask participants to, to stand up and to move a little bit. So I think it's in the small things. I think it's not forgetting that we still live in physical 
physical bodies uh, and we do have physical needs and um, it's just um, always trying to show a positive example and um, always trying to incorporate such small small elements that I don't think are small at the end of the day because they add up uh, in hours and in days and, and in months. And that was obvious. I think it became obvious when the pandemic hit and when people were spending whole trainings and whole working days online, glued on their laptops. And then I think we got the habits of taking care of ourselves. But then uh, nowadays, I, I don't see it happening so much anymore. I think we, we forgot. We forgot that we have to, uh, we also have to move and um, and we have to listen to what our body says. Um, there was a stand-up comedian who <laughs> once made a comparison. He said, we uh, like, I think it was about university professors, but it does refer to different people that they use their bodies to keep, uh, to keep, keep their heads and to move their heads around. So we should not forget that our bodies also have their own needs. And it's not just to keep our head in front of the laptop, uh, but it's also to uh, to take care uh, in a more holistic way uh, of, of our own health and well-being online and offline. Thank you, Dragan. So we kind of mentioned university and professors, so why not asking Amy <laughs> from private and personal tips yeah. and tricks to, to ensure this? Yeah, I'm, I'm really bad with practical tips. <laughs> but um, I think for me, I think the important thing is that some the thing that works for you might not work for others. And, you know, what works will differ. And to really ensure we understand that, I think open communication is key. And so I often say that at, at talks to parents that I think are one of our main challenges is to keep that open communication about technologies with, with children and young people, especially as there's a fear is if something goes wrong online and things will go wrong online because online is just part of their life now, <laughs> that that would lead to repercussions like phones being taken away, kind of very um, kind of internet being withdrawn, for example. And then actually that kind of open communication around the digital world and what we will experience is really important. And I think that's the same in the workplace or in the facilitation um, that often with online meetings and events, that sort of personal communication is a lot harder. So for example, in my team, we try to make a lot of time for figuring out how we can reflect and communicate even in these hybrid, hybrid times that we live in. So I think communication for me is the key thing across many different kind of areas of digital well-being. Thank you very much. Simona. Um, okay, so I would say for, for me, to, the most important thing is to get back to the basics. So meaning that when, in my experience, when we are working in a digital framework, then more uh, is not more, uh, more is uh, <laughs> less, uh, meaning that we really like, you know, we, some of these things that have happened organically and by learning, by making mistakes is that if you used to have a 90 minute session in a working room, you can't have more than 40 to max 60 minutes online of the session, you know, without, and then a break. So just these dynamics, like scaling down certain things and just make things more simple. Uh, people have a different attention spam and they have a harder time following processes uh, online, or we just function differently when we're online. So adapt to that and really scale it down, um, strip, strip down ballast, as we say it in, in Slovenian language, and just really focus on the core. I think this would be for me the most important one. And then just really to support what the Dragan said, because I think making sure that people can be comfortable in their bodies uh, uh, in all its complexity, both physical needs that, you know, that you're actually physically comfortable and everything that Rogan was explaining, but also in terms of how we emotionally react so that people have some uh, ways um, that you that we offer to young people, some ways of support when they are being emotionally distressed also in, in digital processes. If they're learning, they're going to have challenges with that process and, and experience frustration. When they're working with other people in a group, 
group, they are going to get triggered by something. Uh, you know, we are going to say something that is going to offend someone and is going to be disrespectful. And then all of these kind of things, they have an impact. So just offer uh, ways and support mechanisms how people can then also manage this within their body, within the emotional experience of the process. I think this is another one. And then the third one, which goes also with this back to the basics is like, do not it, that we should not forget uh, the fact that it's is super important to have group agreements, you know, like uh, lay lay down the basics of our interactions, like we do it in in physical space, we we do it by now online, but just not to forget because if we assume. You know, if we assume that everyone knows what kind of codes of communication we are using in a new group, uh, then we're very likely to to not uh, be on the same page. So I think these these are the the three most uh, important for me. And then the last one, which I would just repeat something that I said before, is that it's it's I think from my personal experience, it's very important that we have the capacity to keep in mind the diversity of our group that um, you know that we are going to have on the other side people that we don't know all their histories we don't know all the uh, aspects of their identities and their social experiences and then just to try to reflect that and create a safer space for them um, without having to know all the details you know but just to create a space where people can feel safe uh, regardless of of their backgrounds thank you very much Simone as well so there was a lot uh, of different insights and, uh, and elements that uh, uh, our audience will have to process and also our participants in, in the training course. Uh, they will have some quite serious elements to, <laughs> to digest and to discuss. Uh, now, before closing, we already had a, a spoiler <laughs> about the graphic recording that uh, that's uh, Anderson prepared for, for the discussion today, which is now here being shared by Limas. Thank you, by the way, and thank you, that's of course. And you see that it goes in different boxes to show all the different steps that we went through uh, our discussion today. So different elements, uh, equal access, support system, uh, differences and uh, different things affecting different people, mental health, uh, of course, we still need to have an offline dimension together with the, uh, the search and the struggle for connectedness, empathy, and 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 a lot more, a lot more, which will be shared online in our channels uh, together with uh, upcoming, as always, article uh, summing up the content uh, of our discussion today. I'm super happy to uh, thank our guests. Thanks for the. Uh, so many useful tips and insight you share with us. Really, really, it was, uh, I think, a very interesting discussion. It was for me, for sure. Uh, so thank you again. And uh, let's meet somewhere soon to go on discussing about digital well-being. Bye, bye, everybody. And thanks for following us. Bye.